Alban Gerhard. This instrument supposedly belonged to Mussolini at some point. Is one of the world's most highly regarded cellists. I love music, but I've never been in love with the instrument per se. For over 30 years, he has played with dozens of prestigious international orchestras. Prokofiev's music goes far beyond just the Soviet times. It, it is an output of what is great about the Russian people. Albin joined the Ulster Orchestra for the opening concert of the 2023-24 season. One has to stay in control and don't, don't go too crazy, otherwise it just becomes a mess. And sat down to talk about his technique, Prokofiev's Sinfonia Concertante, and more. I always love playing it because people go like, oh, that's amazing, but actually it's just so much fun to play. Thank you so much for joining me today for this interview. I really appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. You play an instrument made in 1710 by Matthew Goffrele. How did you come to play this particular instrument and what are the defining characteristics of uh, Goffrele instruments? And can you tell me more about the maker himself? Well, actually, I've never been very interested in uh, instruments. I love music and since I don't have a very good voice, I picked the cello as, as instrument of choice. But I've never been in love with the instrument per se and Neither have I ever been in love with any specific instrument, not with this one either. So I don't even know anything about the maker except that he's from Northern Italy. Actually, I, I spent, spent a day uh, last month in his birth town, Brixen. The cello was built in Venice and uh, supposedly belonged to Mussolini at some point, which is such bad uh, fame that it might be true. The person who, to uh, who sold it to me 20 years ago claimed that this was historic fact. And it's true that Mussolini was known for liking string instruments, but nobody famous played on it. And it's not a very fine example of Gofrilla, but it sounds good. So it's, it's, it has a very dark color and it's quite big. It's, it's oversized, it probably used to be a church instrument, but the, I'm, I'm proving that I don't care so much about the instrument that, for example, to Belfast, I will come with a completely different instrument. I'm picking up some Guaneri in London, which somebody is offering to me. So I'm, and since I don't, I, I can play on any cello, more or less the same within half hour of preparation, it doesn't really matter. I'm not married to, to any instrument in the past, uh, changed instruments from one concert to the other. The conductor has not realized that first concert was on my Gofrilla and the second concert was on a newly built instrument. So finally, I, I'm more about the music than the instrument per se. For 15 years, I've always played on the Gofrilla and then it needed repair last year. So I needed to find a substitute because I only have that one. And I found a nice substitute. And while looking for it, I found somebody who was interested in investing in a cello. So since then, I've been looking if maybe there is a cello which is even nicer than my Gorfrilla. So far without luck, but who knows, maybe in Belfast, that's the instrument I will uh, play the rest of my life with. We'll, we'll see. It's definitely exciting because every instrument brings another personality and color. And the older, the more interesting and sometimes screwed up. I, I've played on, on a Galliano last month and that was had a beautiful color but had some notes which didn't work at all. To get to get around that, it's it's quite a nice challenge. Okay. It had a much lighter voice than mine. And, and it's actually it's nice to play on different instruments. And I, I never did that, so it's it's a new experience. Yeah, uh, brilliant. Is it simply that the notes didn't work or what do you mean by screwed up? Well they they would uh, they refuse to to speak. So they, they, instead of going, ah, they go like, ah, <laughs> it's what, what we call, what we call wolves, wolf's notes. Oh. It's, so it's really, it's like a howling. And, and there are some tricks how to deal with that, with pressure of the bow and how you hold the cello. And there's some trick with pu pushing with the left knee to the, in the back of the instrument to suppose, su support the sound pose. So it's all, yeah, it, it makes it more interesting actually. I just wanted to know your kind of experience uh, with the work. Um, so do you have a, like a story with this work? Like, do, have you played this work before? And, you know, what are your experiences playing this particular work? 
but I think I heard the piece live by Rostropovich, who was the greatest cellist of all times for me. Oh, definitely the most influential cellist because he inspired so many wonderful composers to write for this instrument. In this particular case, he actually did not inspire Prokofiev to write the piece, but he co-wrote it. It's, it's, it's an interesting story because Prokofiev wrote a cello concerto, but somehow he, I think Prokofiev wasn't happy with it and then Rostopovich played it for him and they both weren't so happy. Then Rostopovich convinced um, Prokofiev to rewrite it and he came up with that version, which is more spectacular, more easy listening and less modern. So it, it made it to the standard repertoire much easier than that actual original concerto. I'm recording for the British label Hyperion and they agreed to put both concertos on one CD. So I recorded actually the concerto and the symphony concertante, which makes sense in so far as the, the concerto and they share the same subjects, but goes completely different. Like a different composer, you not a different composer, but uh, at a different point of his life, revisiting the same piece and coming up with a completely different piece. It's it's quite amazing. I, I find the concerto much more difficult and it's more modern. So it's actually more Prokofiev. And Prokofiev just had this strong influence on the symph cello symphony or the Sinfonia Concertante that it's easier to play and it sounds much more difficult than it is. So I always love playing it because people go like, oh, that's amazing. But actually, it's just so much fun to play. And I heard Rostopovich play it in Berlin and I grew up with his L uh, LP and loved it. So once I had a chance to play it, I was probably 22, 23. I, I, I jumped on the opportunity because it was always one of my favorite pieces. Prokofiev was always one of my favorite composers as like like we all grew up with Peter and the Wolf and and all these whatever Cinderella and and uh, the ballets but also the symphonies and I, I used to be a pianist so the first modern piece I played as a seven year old was a gavotte by Prokofiev and I remember that at, at first I thought ooh that is new to me and I I, I felt this rejection of of the modern thing and actually after a week or so I I, I learned the language of that fantastic composer. It's actually the best composer of the 20th century for kids, I think, because it's so colorful. And any kid should listen to Cinderella by Prokofiev because it's yeah, it's so rich and easy to understand with, with a naive mind somehow. And I, had, I, I have rather a naive mind. I'm not the analytic person, so I, I always had a big weakness for Prokofiev. To come back to Rostropovich, you, um, you say you, you saw uh, him perform the piece live. Do you have any more kind of thoughts on that? Actually, I have very strong thoughts um, that I actually preach whenever I teach in masterclasses to completely forget what these great people did. I mean, in, in, in our case, Rostropovich is responsible for a lot of repertoire. And in order to play that repertoire well, I would recommend to forget what he did. So I grew up with his playing, but his interpretations, I, I completely, I haven't listened to it since 25 years. And I, I do play it quite different to how he played it. And not because I don't like how he played it, but I came up with a different solution. And that's, that's the job of a performer. We should not try to um, imitate what the great ones did, but we should try to be great ourselves and come up with our own view of, of a certain piece. And, and in mu it's funny, in music, we tend to repeat um, great performances over and over. We grow up with recordings and now even worse with YouTube and people then think that's, that's what it should be. Even critics, they compare maybe in England, not as much, or in the UK, not as much as in Germany, but in Germany, the critics, they listen to recordings and they think, oh, that's how it has to go. If you compare that to theater, it's the opposite. I mean, if any theater director would uh, copy the interpretation of whatever piece from anybody else, he would be finished. And uh, like my, my favorite example is the Elgar concerto with Jacqueline Dupre. 
we tend to repeat her wonderful interpretation to this point that it becomes a caricature. And with the Prokofiev, it is a bit similar um, that people think, oh, Rostropovich, he co-wrote it, so he must know. No, he doesn't. He's just another cellist who played wonderful, but the audience should not be interested in another version of Rostropovich. So actually, I, as much as he influenced me as a young person to wanting to become a cellist, as, as little impact he has on my playing today and on, on my interpretations. How, aside from obviously um, all of that, how does um, knowing the history behind the Sinfonia Concertante by Prokofiev influence how you approach the work, so the particular history behind that piece? I know a bit about Prokofiev's life and obviously Soviet times and all that, but I think great music lives on its own. So you can actually tell from the score what's in it. I don't need to know much background. I don't need to know the first performer. I don't need to know that a cellist co-wrote it. It's actually quite obvious because it fits the hand well. So either the composer knew the cello incredibly well or he consulted a good cellist. So that, that you can see from the score. I don't need that additional information. And... I mean, Prokofiev is not being reduced to that. His his compatriot, Shostakovich, for in my eyes, is sometimes reduced to being against Stalin and Soviet, and, and, and it completely takes out of consideration the person and, and, and rather the, the culture, the, the long tradition of Russian suffering, uh, which has nothing to do with Soviet times, but just it, it's in the people. Somehow, if you read the Russian literature, it becomes imminent that these people are quite deep and quite sad. It's not a happy, happy fellows. And in the Symphony Concertante, also, there's a lot of deep sadness. There's some spectacular moments, but it goes much deeper than the show off, which actually Rostopovich used to do a bit with that piece. I, and, and I don't think Rostopovich was the deepest of all people. So for, for for me to if I rec if I shall recommend to young players what to do to understand the spirit, I would I, I send them to read everything by Dostoevsky. If if you read uh, Pyotr Dostoevsky, my my first book was the Brother Karamazov. I read when I actually on my way to studying in Cincinnati with eighteen, somebody handed me the Great Inquisitor, and then I fell in love with. I mean that's the middle chapter of the Brother Karamazov, and then I fell in love with. Uh, Dostoevsky in general, and for the next five years, I read everything. And that informed me much more about how to play Russian music than any Russian instrumentalist. Uh, you sort of uh, find yourself wanting to tell kind of the story of the emotions, not only behind the piece, but like y you have looked at other kind of uh, Russian artistic output and have uh, sort of created your own sort of narratives about how you want to interpret the piece. Would, would you would you say that's the case? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's not it's not about the politics back then. Obviously, it was a horrible time. I mean, I, Prokofiev. I mean, unluckily, he died the same day Stalin died, so he didn't even get a great funeral. I think there was the sad story where how they brought his body somewhere around corners because the streets were all crowded with with uh, the celebration or the farewell to the <laughs> second or first most horrible dictator of all times. Um, so he lived in bad times for, for Prokofiev. But I think his music goes far beyond just the Soviet times. It, it is an output of what is great about the Russian people. So you mentioned earlier a little bit about the uh, technique within the, the piece and how sort of flashy it does sound to an audience. So uh, what sort of other technical demands does Prokofiev, in particular in the second movement, create for the soloist in um, Sinfonia Concertante? Oh, good question. Well, it's quite tiring. One has to use the resources well and not burn it all in the first movement, for example already the very beginning starts loud. So if we start pressing like crazy, which I used to do, um, then we get too tired and we will have a hard time in the second movement. The second movement is the longest and 
the most virtuosic in a way, has this big cadenza. Well, technically, it's nothing really special. It's one, one plays the cello and it has some gorgeous tunes. People always think that second uh, movement is the hardest because it has some flashy fireworks. I like it best because it has this gorgeous second theme, which um, it's so typical Prokofiev that I can live without the 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 fireworks. Just those the side theme is so beautiful, and that's more meaningful to me. The the cadenza, yeah, it's it's fine. One has to stay in control and don't don't go too crazy. Otherwise, it just becomes a mess. And I just heard the greatest concert in my life, the opening concert of Berlin Phil with Kirill Petrenko doing uh, some the Rager Mozart variations and uh, Heldenleben, uh, Hero's Life by Richard Strauss. And it was in so far so beautiful as the, I've never heard such great balance within the orchestra, but that's why I remember he builds this long arch so he doesn't, shoot it right at the beginning because there's a lot of fortissimos you can use to show what great sound an orchestra can make but he timed it so well and he was micromanaging to, to the effect that not only me who knows the piece backward was deeply moved but I've never heard the hall in Berlin be that silent but not silent because oh we shouldn't talk but silent because we were breathtaking and breathless we didn't dare to breathe and and that only happens if you really manage to build a long arch over the whole thing. And, and that's the big challenge of the second movement, to really time it well so that we don't just go boo, 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 but, but um, find all the details and, and, and tell the story and, and go for the emotions rather than the fireworks. Yes, absolutely. There's something very special about a concert when when everyone is is together in a hall and everyone just feels the moment yeah. of like yeah, it 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 hits a sweet spot and then there's an explosion of like just every emotion you can think of um exactly. all at once. It's it's and, absolutely and, and and by not going for the cheap uh lowest common denominator as loud as possible and as fast as possible constantly. But, but to really sh show us how life goes and not life is not always full and lush. It's they are hard moments and and in the Prokofiev that definitely comes out the 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 harshness and the brutality of life as well as the beauty and yeah. the fun. There's a, the, the last movement, for example, is actually quite funny. It's it's meant probably as a joke. Yes, yes, absolutely. And 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 I, I always feel like a concert is such a, a, an ephemeral thing and it can, you know, go uh, multiple ways. In one concert, you might feel like a certain thing and you will never feel that way exactly again. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time with me today uh, to do this interview. Pleasure. Have Love a lovely day. All the best. Take care, Alvin. All the best. You too. Bye. Bye.